I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Mrs. Mayor, if you would take the roll, please. I would be happy to. Tom Cruise. Here. Cheryl Hancock. Here. Anita Jacobsinski. Here. Kate Mayer, I'm here. Tim Menninger. Here. Lisa Collins. Excused. Gary Dunlap. Here. Okay, thank you. With six of the seven school board members present, I would declare a quorum. Uh, board norms reflection on our agenda. Any comments or concerns? Otherwise, I would just call attention to the school board members. Um, attention that they are in the blue folders and just a reminder to um, be open to those as our meeting progresses this evening. Approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been posted, distributed, and sent to the local media with this in mind. Are there any changes? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, a motion has been made and seconded to approve the agenda as published. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Mm -hmm. Public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? We ask that a five minute time period per person be followed. Please come forward, state your name, address, and topic to be addressed. <clears throat> Is there anyone who would like to address the board? Please come forward and have a seat. Yes. And then just your name, address, and topic to be addressed. Um, my name is Brenda Lohucky, and our address is 914 Packer Drive. And yes, we are Green Bay Packer fans. <laughs> and we are, I'm here to talk about the class numbers being proposed for third grade at Evergreen. OK, please. Okay. Well, first I'd like to say how grateful our family is that our kids live in the school district of Holman because we have had nothing but phenomenal, phenomenal teachers and an education for each of our kids. And that runs the gamut from special ed up to talented and gifted. It goes from elementary all the way up to high school. As I mentioned, we have four kids and they have had nothing but the best education here. Um, last week, my fourth grader came off the bus and she had a huge smile on her face. And she said, mom, you have to read what one of my teachers wrote in my school yearbook. And so I'd like to share that. It says, Chloe, I fell in love with you as your fourth grade, or as your 4K teacher, and have grown to love you more and more every year. You are a wonderful young lady at Evergreen, and this place is a better world because of you. That's what every parent wants for their child. They want their child to feel valued and special and unique, and I worry about that happening in a class of 30. <coughs> I think it's really impossible because of the time constraints. Um, so yes, I'm concerned about the high class numbers, and I feel like I have a pretty good leg to stand on. I've been volunteering in the um, Homeless School District as a parent volunteer for the last nine years. My youngest um, is now in going into third grade, and I've been with this particular group of students since they were in 4K. And um, I'm also an elementary educator. I work part-time, so I'm able to also volunteer part-time. And this is honestly one of the neediest group of kids I've ever worked with professionally or personally. And I think their, their needs are very, extreme in terms of behavior and in terms of their academic performance. Um, when I talked to Camden, he's our youngest going into third grade, and I asked him, what, you know, what are the special um, services or challenges of the kids in your classroom? And this is what he told me. Two kids receive speech services. Two kids get reading help. One child has a behavior chart. He thought another student should have a behavior chart, and he assured me it wasn't him. Um, another student needs help paying attention. They have a ball chair. Another student. Um, is hyper, <laughs> that's his opinion. Um, another student has an MSG allergy, two with peanut butter allergies, one in a wheelchair, one with asthma, and two that receive talented and gifted services. And these are just the, I'm sure it's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what we know and what the un, unknown needs are of those, of those students. So the last time, <clears throat> excuse me, when I was volunteering in his class, I looked around and, and if any of you have been in those classrooms, I'm sure you had the same question. How do you fit another 10 bodies and another 10 desks in here and make that a productive classroom setting, productive academic setting. And I don't know how you do that. Um, if you think about it, if you have 30 kids in a classroom and a, t a teacher calls on every child equally, your child would get called on once every 30 questions. 
I don't think those are very good odds. And so I don't think anyone here would disagree that that is, that that is what is best for kids because it's not, it, it's common sense. I think it boils down to two things. I think it boils down to money and I think it boils down to priority. And I think that you need to look at the unique needs of these kids and not make your decision solely based on money. And I think that if you, I think you need to make the, I think you need to have a priority on making class sizes smaller because if you don't, I honestly feel like you are setting up those teachers and those kids to fail. And if not to fail, you're making it extremely difficult for them to be successful. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board at this time? Anyone else who would like to address the board at this time? Okay, seeing none, then we will move forward to reports and discussion, the 2014-2015 elementary staffing report. Dr. Carlson. Well, good evening, everyone. This evening, I present options to the elementary staffing plan presented to the board on April 28th, based on the board's direction from the May 12th board meeting. <clears throat> on May 12th, the board approved the recommended staffing plan with the exception of the elementary portion. The board asked for more information about class size makeup of student needs, as had been reported by parents and teachers for grade three at Evergreen for next year. At the May 12th meeting and at the May 27th meeting, the, the board directed administration to provide further information, including options that would address concerns that have been expressed, again, by staff members, parents, and, and board members as well, about the projected class size averages for uh, grade three at Evergreen for next year and possibly in other areas uh, across the elementary grades in the school district. Information had been shared with the board by parents and staff regarding an exceptionally high level of student needs in grade two this year at Evergreen, resulting in concerns expressed again by parents, staff, and board members about projected class sizes. And again, at that time uh, for, of 29, for the 2014-15 school year. Board members requested more information from administration about the grade level makeup of student needs. So at the May 27th board meeting, administration shared student information that uh, really believed needed to be shared in closed session about uh, based on the confidential confidentiality requirements. Administration does believe the information sh shared does suggest that there are other grade levels in addition to grade three at Evergreen for next year that experience similar, if, if not different, or unique or higher needs as well across the district. And this has been the case in the past as well. So the elementary staffing plan presented back on April 28th was based on preliminary enrollment projections dating back to April 4th. The number of sections outlined in that plan was based on application of the class size administrative rule. And we've talked about that quite a bit, uh, the number 343.2. At that time, we were projecting 76 sections for grades K through five across the district. Based on updated enrollment projections from May 29th, we are now projecting 74 sections based on application of the class size administrative rule. And part of this reason, you may recall, part of the reason uh, comes back to kindergarten, how um, back in April, it was a little less of an accurate projection using the best information we had. And I even noted at that time that as we move along, kindergarten will become a little bit 
uh, certainly more accurate picture. But at the same time, actually our overall enrollment across the six grades across the district has not changed that much since April, even though kindergarten has become a little bit more accurate. That, and part of that is because there has been some additions since April as far as enrollments for next year, but also <coughs> some movements and uh, especially at kindergarten. We currently have staffing in place for next year for 74 sections. The options I present this evening are based on the new projection of 74 sections. It's important to know, again, at the time of putting this report together, you always have to pick a date. And uh, so as the April 28th report was based on April 4th, this tonight, I'm going back to May 29th. Um, so based on the updated projections from May 29th, I've outlined the areas in which we are closely monitoring due to a remaining capacity in student enrollment of five or less before the class size administrative rule would suggest consideration to add another section. Identifying those grade levels in specific schools in which there is a capacity of five or less is something administration developed and is intended really to be used um, by administration as we monitor the grade level enrollments. So as of May 29th, you see on the chart that we have two situations, kindergarten at Sand Lake and Viking at second grade. Um, again, these are listed by, I guess, in order of grade. But if you look at the red numbers, those numbers would indicate the amount of room we would have remaining based on the current um, guidelines. So that kindergarten Sand Lake and second grade Viking show zero in red. That means for both of those, if we would enroll one more student at each of those, then your guidelines would suggest we add another section. And so you can go through that. You can see um, next you have fourth grade at Sand Lake that with the number one, that means there's truly a capacity of one remaining, so another two students. So you can look at that uh, list. I, would, I can share with you with a, a high level of confidence that some of these numbers have already changed since May 29th. And this is not unusual. This is something that your principals and, and us, we, human resources, we continue to closely work with these as, they, as we move through the next few weeks into July as well. I would say, for example, uh, what was shared with me Friday, uh, we've talked a lot about grade three at Evergreen. And as of Friday, um, we're probably forecasting 60 students at this time, and this was um, May 29th, 58. So that just is one, one example. Everybody, you've seen this before. As I present the options this evening, I'll be referencing the current administrative rule. And uh, I've, we certainly have um, I've presented this and discussed it in, in the past, beginning with the philosophical statement. In establishing the guidelines with this rule, the following considerations um, have been given, even from when it was developed and reviewed in the past. But it's, of course, I mean, there's been more attention given to these as well. Um, so using these considerations, the board's administrative rule identifies guidelines to be used when determining class sizes. The administrative rule provides the following guidelines in which the district uses. So as you see, again, and it's a little, it may be difficult to see in the back of the room, but on the left side, you have grade levels, the next column, it says district guidelines, and you have 18 for pre-K and so on. And then you go to the next set of grade levels and so on. And so um, tonight, when we're talking about the elementary staffing plan, um, we've often referenced the guidelines of kindergarten through grade five. And this will be important to note because one of my options that I present to you um, revises this, modifies this. Also, 
there's been a lot of reference and mention to a formula that in the past I've actually provided uh, an example of how that is applied. So I present four options in response to board direction requests and direction. All four options would require a revision to the current the board administrative rule. All four options address, in this case, specific, um, the grade three at Evergreen for next year as far as resulting in the addition of a section through a change in the administrative rule. So this, um, the four options, beginning with A, and I'll go through each one of these a little bit more detailed on the coming slides. But option A lowers the class size maximum from 30 to 28 students for grades pre-K through three. And so on the administrative rule, as you read through, there is, um, this is separate from the guideline that I just put up on the screen, but you read through and you'll see that it says that no class should go over 30 students. And so that's what this is pertaining to. You would lower that from 30 to 28. Option B, you go back to those district guidelines that I just put up on the screen, that column, and it had said 24 for grade three. And so option B would be lowering that guideline from 24 to 23. What difference does that make? Um, again, when you continue to utilize the formula, that would drop that uh, number down where it would suggest to add a section. Option C, uh, we've talked about um, not only grade three at Evergreen for next year, but other areas that are approaching that upper limit of, the, of, the, of your guideline. And so, um, in fact, the board has received some information about how some other grade levels across the district look. So this option would be built into, would build into the administrative rule a section where um, if, if students would, if the numbers would fall into those red areas, um, that it would drive or recommend another section. And then option D, there's been, there's been discussion about the formula. There's also been discussion about the, that maximum size, which is up in option A. And um, I think I've had questions along the way about, there's some confusion when you look at the district guideline of 24 for grade three, for example, or 20 for kindergarten. Some have questioned me and asked me about, I, don't, I didn't think that any class, any individual class at any grade level in any school is to ever go above that. So this option attempts to address that and actually would eliminate the formula and cap. So your new max would be those district guidelines. And I can talk more about that in a little bit. So back to option A, to modify the administrative rule by lowering the class size limitation, again, that max, um, from 30 to 28 for grades pre-K through three. Again, this addresses concerns for any class size for grade three of being more than 28. Um, and so as you can see here, that would mean, and much of this is taken right from the current administrative rule, I just changed the numbers. So the third bullet, when any class reaches 29, uh, currently it says 31. Results of that, well, you would increase one classroom section at this time. And again, this is based on May 29th. So if you went with this option, that would drive an increase of one classroom, and currently that would be grade three at Evergreen. Um, this increase of one classroom compared to the most recent projection of May 29th, it would increase one classroom, so we'd be looking at 75 sections. However, based on what was presented to the board in April, 75 sections would still be one less than 76 presented. 
I make a note on several of these. On this one, the last bullet, um, about in the future, this revision may impact the number of related arts classroom sections. Anytime we increase the regular classroom sections at the elementary level, when you do that or reduce, it likely will impact to some degree the staffing for our related arts, our music, our art, our PE, and so on. Option B. This would be to modify the administrative rule to lower grade three, the grade three guideline from 24 to 23. And as I just briefly mentioned a few minutes ago, again, the result of this, I can tell you, for example, if um, it would, um, you would not, it would lower, if you're looking at, at grade three at Evergreen, for example, it would lower that, that uh, number and would drive another section. So if uh, the board wished to move to this option, it would increase, again, at this point, based on what we know, it would increase two classroom sections in the district, one for grade three at Evergreen and one for grade three at Viking. And again, just a caution, that's based on May 29th data. So increasing two sections, just drawing a comparison to that new projection of 74 that the current formula would, uh, guidelines would uh, suggest. And so um, increase two above that, but also compared to April, um, it would be uh, maintaining that same overall number. And again, I made the same comment. I think right now we wouldn't notice a significant impact because we still are within 76. And the, that's the number of sections that we, we uh, have this year as far as our staffing with related arts. Option C gets at that um, other grade levels that are on the upper limit. And so it would allow the addition of one classroom section at each grade level at each school that has a remaining capacity of five or fewer students. And you would still be using the same um, other guidelines, but this would just be plugged in. I think there may be more other ways to accomplish this, but in the short time frame that I've had, uh, this, is, this is what I offer at this time. Um, there might be a way to manipulate the formula or some of the other numbers. But I know that there was questions about other, other sections and looking at some of the unique needs of the makeup and how our, how our classrooms really today look. So this option, uh, results in an increase of eight classroom sections based on the May 29th data <clears throat> over the 74. So we have 82. And, but 82 compared to the 76 back in April, that would be a difference of six additional sections. This option most closely aligns again with some of the information the board has received on the makeup of some other um, grade levels on the upper limits. This option would result in the acceleration of the f district's facility plan, more so than the uh, pre previous two options. This option would result in an increase in the number of related arts classroom sections. Unless, again, something, uh, we did something different with related arts, if we uh, scheduled the same way, I think our principals would say that, that this would uh, drive some additional increases in the area of related arts. And I also add a bullet here about looking at there's certain, there's certain sets of materials that really come as classrooms. And even though the number of overall students may not change, there's some materials that we really need to keep together as classrooms. So that's another, I think, thing worth noting if you make a significant increase. And finally, the last option. This is, again, while it may appear um, well, this option is clearly the one that, that would result in the increase of the greatest number of sections. But it is uh, the one that if you did away with the max, so the 30 number, 
and you went strictly by those guidelines that were up on the monitor prior. So 20 at, grade, at kindergarten and one, 22 at grade two, 24 at three and four and so on. That that's currently right now what the result would be. Um, so, and again, many of the same outcomes or results of that as far as uh, the facility plan and, and so on. Quite honestly, with this option, um, we would really have to take a, a good look at our current schools. I'm thinking of Sand Lake, for example, especially, and the space that's available. So next steps. Next steps would be for the board to provide direction and or approval of either one or more of the options presented um, or no change to the administrative rule or other options if I've not addressed some of the interests that um, have been discussed in the past. The board has not approved an elementary staffing plan, what I, which I look to you to do each year. I would ask the board to consider approval at the June 23rd board meeting. So based on direction tonight, I would craft an issue paper for the June 23rd meeting where this item would be then also placed on the consent agenda. If the board's not comfortable with that at that point, then I would appreciate direction with that. There have been questions by the board on if you wanted to modify the administrative rule how would, we, how would we do that with the timing? If the board wishes to revise the administrative rule and again, it does not want to, for example, um, bring the SOC or the Student Achievement and Learning Committee together, uh, you could perhaps just simply provide direction and a directive that this will be changed. We're gonna to move to this, one of the options, for example, and that then you would um, provide that direction to the people with the SOC committee that right away when they do reconvene that um, with the direction given by the board they make the necessary revisions. I know that, that that's a concern of trying to continue make sure we follow our process that you have in place already. Please know that we continue to closely monitor grade level enrollments as we have always done as we move forward. One timeline I mentioned here at the last bullet, one timeline that we believe is important is to not reduce any planned classroom sections no later than July 15th. We've tried to do this the last year or two. There are times when a grade level enrollment will drop a, below the guidelines late in the summer. However, we believe we need to make a commitment in time for teachers to begin communicating with parents in early August following registration. So after this happens, we don't believe it is the right thing to do to reduce a grade level at a school. However, there are times when late enrollments require consideration to add sections. And so we have had to do this uh, even in August. It's not ideal. Some of the similar, our teachers would say, some of the similar disruption occurs um, once they've communicated with parents, it's hard to add a section, but I think it is uh, something that we um, would likely come to the board and recommend. So with that, I'll entertain questions, comments. Um, I hope this has been helpful. A lot of work has gone into this. I appreciate the help of our elementary principals, our human resources, Julie Crackle and pupil services and others and um, really try to provide some options that, um, again, would allow the board to address some of the things that uh, have been shared in the past couple of board meetings. So Dr. Carlson is looking for some input and thoughts from the board. I, I just had a question, Dale. Yes. At the beginning you said, um, I'm sorry, um, that as of last Friday at Evergreen, in third grade, there were 60 students, not 58, that you're projecting. I believe that's correct. Okay. As well as some other, but I don't have all, I don't have that tonight, as some of the other grade levels as well have changed. And that's something that 
it just mm. continues. So anyway, I could talk more about that if it would be helpful. Gary? <clears throat> um, I have a question for the high school, and that is, what is the minimum number of students in a class before you make a change? For the high school, there, well, formally there isn't a minimum. We deal with that on an individual basis. And so as we go through the staffing and Mr. Baer um, add in at any time. Um, I guess I kind of knew that and, and the reason I said that was it's odd that the minimum, if you take a look at the number of students and who's involved there and the needs of those students and make, it a, make, an, make a decision based on that, and then we use the strict formula for, for grade school kids. That's, that seems uh, misapplied. I have another question, that is um, <clears throat> philosophical considerations. Um, it seems to me like the board, and some of us have been around forever, it seems like, it seems like those philosophical considerations, if those were considered and uh, addressed, you know, we have, we have the formula as, as, as cut and dried, but these, these considerations are meant to be there for exactly what we're talking about, and that is, uh, the, you look at the ages of the students, you can take that into consideration, the degree of dependence or independence, you take that into consideration. It doesn't say read all these considerations and then cut it off at 29. That's what these are here for, and those are for, um, you know, take the nature of the course or class content. It seems like this is being applied to the high school minimum, but not the, not the grade school maximum. And if, we, if we take these considerations and apply them, um, the facility and its limitation, number of special needs students to be assigned, the nature of the course, the class content, take those individually and, and address those toward the class that we're looking at. If the class is getting close to being the maximum, we, we take a look at these, these philosophical considerations and say, well, maybe we should apply some more resources here. He's working about. I, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Um, yeah, on um, page one, like, not page one, page three of your presentation, um, you did say that the findings that we asked for when you brought them forward suggested that other <coughs> classrooms have experienced similar or higher needs and this has happened in the past. And, and one of my couple of things, one comment is perhaps we're only looking at this now because yes, people did step up and bring it to our attention. And as board members, we're not as savvy in everything we need to be, but, but I appreciate those comments and bringing them forward. So if there are, if there are similar needs, that worries me a bit and um, have this wonderment that you don't necessarily need to answer right now, but how long has that been going on? And as a board member, I should know. I, I should be savvy on that, and I just haven't been. And who addresses that? If there are, if there are when I hear someone tell me there are similar needs, but we're not meeting them, that worries me a bit. Um, another question, is in regard to our formula, um, I don't know, it might have been me or someone else have asked for other classroom sizes comparatively, like especially West Salem and Alaska, and how we compare to them and, how, and what their policy is. Um, and so I kind of l looked for that on my own and realized that our classroom sizes in the elementary levels seem really high um, when I look at numbers. So if I look at one of our local schools, I'll just compare two local schools. Out of 55 classrooms, only 11 have 23 or more students. And the top level of students they have is 25. And I'm talking about kindergarten through fifth. Another one, um, I don't have the count of the classrooms, but only six have 23 or more kids in 4K. And then I look at us, 
and I see 22 classrooms that are 23 or higher. And, and, and that bothers me a bit. And yet, we're the, then I also think about we're the only ones that have this formula. And I kind of wonder, where did this formula come from? And I think it was me who asked the question originally about when we go on the website and we look on guidelines and our parents see, our guidelines are a certain number. But in reality, not really, because we wait till the formula is met. Um, and I, I, I do see, I do see some cause to worry about our class sizes. And yes, I understand this is an economic thing, and it might not be able to be done for all of our students in a year. But it's an issue I really want to pursue and keep talking about. Um, I think one of you already brought up, like, the last count you had was on May 29th, but every day things change, right? And, and you're, you're not sure what the latest count is for... No, I don't have that for you tonight. Don't ha you don't have that not information. Not okay. today. Um, A uh, question about if we did go to 75. So I'm on like page five of the of the PowerPoint hard copy <coughs> that I have. Um, option A, if we did go to 75, um, the last bullet says, in the future, this revision may impact the number of related arts classroom sections. But uh, my question is, would that happen if we did do an exception for this one? because I thought we had that many sections already. What we're looking at maybe if we go to 75? Yeah, correct. Correct, so it wouldn't, so that one exception would not impact an, another arts teacher? Right, if I can just clarify, I, th mm -hmm. I think I said that, again, the first two right now, because they'd still both be still within the 76 that we currently have, would Thank not. You. I thought it was just worth noting that whenever you change the administrative rule, Absolutely. Yes. That you don't know what it might do in the future. Sure, FIAD and music and everything else. Yes, yeah. I understand that. Um, that's it, I think. Questions? Yeah. Tom, you have a question? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, just curious, uh, where this original rule of this number for classroom sizes that was it's two years old, where did, maybe we answered this already. Where did that rule come from? It was in, it's in the handbook that we, we keep referencing. I'm just curious where that came from. This is a board administrative rule. Okay, that so, one that's in there, that, that was decided two years ago? It was reviewed two years ago. It's been, I can it's been a, I don't, I don't this have this the is, date okay. that Dr. it was originally Where did it come from? I remember reducing the class. Yeah, right. when it Dr. initiated during um, Dr. Frick's administration yeah. okay. I it was actually there before I came on the board okay because Darty Berg I know she this was one of the reasons she ran for the board and she talks about that about her kids and sure and that kind of thing and so I'm it, just wondering where's a based, long time yeah where's it's, based from this number where does this number come from is it something that the federal government or a bigger no, entity this, decides or I just was curious what the science what the methodology to get this, this number comes from this would be a local decision okay we discussed it at length as a board. We, I was on the board and we reduced it down to the, where it's at from, uh, uh, it was a substantially higher number if I remember right. Yep. And uh, we discussed it and, and discussed it with the professionals and the teachers and so on and said, what, what does everyone be, uh, well, what will everyone be comfortable with as a class size and involve the parents and so on and that's how we ended up with. Okay. Well, I do think, I think that parents coming and talking, it's impressive that they, you know, there's a constant barrage of you, it's really nice to see. Um, and I do think the class sizes are more critical at a younger age, so. Any other questions or comments? Just, do you know when that, for, oh, I'm sorry, you can go ahead, Tim. Tim. I was just gonna say, I, I, I believe the, uh, the administrative rule has been re referred to the Student Achievement Learning Committee for review, but I also 
no, we cannot wait for that review to take action. But I do think, and that's why that, Dr. Carlson has submitted these options. Yeah, exactly. Right. And and I do think though that this, you know, to to Tom's point and others, that I think now is the time to look at this because of the concern not only for this classroom but all the other classrooms that are in this potentially same position. Because I too believe that class size does have a big impact and. Um, I also kind of understand why we have the um, the maximum number. You know, I mean, obviously, you want to try and avoid that minimum. It is ironic that we have it in some places we don't in others um, from that standpoint. But um, It seems to me in the high school it's less of a applicable because you would think you're dealing with adults a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a child, you they have less control, so I don't know. <laughs> and so tonight, I guess, are we looking for to come to some consensus on recommendation amongst those four options? Is that? I think they, Dr. Carlson would like some input on that so that he would be able to bring a recommendation back to the board then. So. I would like, I would like to. Um, Before we do that, Anita, did you have anything? No, in I, I, I was kind of holding back and Kate said really well exactly what I would want to say. Um, <clears throat> class size is so vital and kids are all so different that to apply a, a formula to kids, it, every classroom is made up of, of all different personalities, abilities, um, mobilities, everything, teachers, the, it's just, it's hard to apply one rule to uniformly across every classroom in the district and think that it'll work for everyone. So I, I really think it's important for us to look, change some things up. If we need to make adjustments based on the students in a classroom, then, then let's do it. And then in the fall when the SALT committee meets again, get some, some things more down more solidly. But my God, they'll, you know, <laughs> and like Gary said, that's why I said I was so proud of you because you really hit the nail on the head. I mean, we look at it for high school, but really not for elementary kids. And they're the ones who really need the, this is your ability, this is your ability. What do you all have together? And what can, what can one teacher deal with in one day? I mean, if you have 30 kids who really have low needs and are real high achieving, and you have a you know superwoman or superman for a teacher, you might be able to do that. But you might have 15 kids in a classroom and and superman for a teacher and not be able to to do a great job. And I don't want to set anyone up for failure. The kids or our staff, they're a team. So I need I think we need to help them out. But I do have to say one thing. Um, and this may be getting on a high horse, but due to the budget cuts in our state, I think people have, um, I, I think people are gonna see that there are gonna be cuts that hurt. And it's been a few years since these things have, have kind of had the domino effect. Um, things, people are gonna start noticing things like this, class sizes increasing, cuts in different areas, and things are, you're gonna start seeing things that are a result of the state's budget cuts, the ed education funding cuts, and it's so unfortunate. We need to change that. People need to vote and vote for what's best for kids and what's best for our schools. And tell your neighbors to vote for what's best for our schools and education. So, you know, it, we, we need to support this, but we only have so much money too, but so vote in November, it's very important. And let's do what's right for kids in this instance, every instance, but tonight this is what we're supporting. Well, Ms. And Mrs. Hancock, could I just, I'm sorry. Sure. Just, the high school has come up now a couple times from Mr. Dunlap's question. And um, I would have to say for the most part, many of those conversations uh, don't necessarily address um, whether it's some of the identified needs of students and so on that has been much of the conversation with this, it comes down to with some of your elective areas, for example, and how many students are we willing to keep a class for to make sure that we are vocational areas and so on, that which we believe strongly in, that we keep those going. You've had some conversation in the past about some of more of our advanced classes and may not even have to be a high level um, course 
where if we don't offer it, then there are some um, options. Um, so I, I wouldn't want people to think that it's, it's totally the same issue, but I agree. Uh, and we've said this, and we, I think we do need to move in that direction of setting more of some targets for on those minimum sizes. And Mr. Bear and I have talked about that and know that we need to do that. In fact, I think Mr. Bear sat right here not one of the past board meetings and said that as well. So we know we have work to do, but just if you, at the high school level, if you start and going down that road, then we'll have those conversations about some of our elective areas, for example. Um, those, some of those areas are some of those that tend to be more that lower enrollment. Thank you. So from the information that you presented and that has been presented um, to us, and I know I took away a lot of information from the closed session the other evening. And one of the things, I don't want it to be implied that the building administrators ignore those considerations because they, it was very clear from that information that um, whether you have nine students with IEPs or 20 students with IEPs, that that was looked at when they were looking at um, class size and their classrooms. And I think as a board, and they've assured me, and I believe them, <clears throat> none of them want to have, our elementary building administrators want to have 30 students in the classroom either. And, um, but they need what, a question I asked and, and um, outside was, what can we do for you? And they really need a guideline or a formula or something that's going to allow them to be consistent in the district and we've said that over and over again that it doesn't should not matter whether you are attending Viking Elementary or Evergreen or Prairie View or Sand Lake that you're going to have that same educational um, experience or similar educational experience and so for me whichever one of these options we take for me that's a, a key thing is that it's not just to address the issue in one classroom which may be naturally addressing itself by the number of students that are are there but that we look at this for all of our students especially I am troubled by a class with 20 IEPs the vast majority of those students stay in the classroom for the full day but keep in mind we're not talking about one teacher for 30 students or 20 students or 24 students there are aides and um, oftentimes where students are taken out and special needs t um, teachers additional staff so for me it's just important that we be consistent with what we do district-wide and whichever option we choose um, allows us to do that um, and we'll have to if it's good for the students we've got to find a way to do that and find those resources that's one of my favorite quotes from a, an administrator I worked with is it's the right thing to do for students so let's find them the resources to do it so I don't know I, I, the, I don't know if any of those options I think a couple of them begin to do it but I suspect with as has been mentioned the student achievement and learning committee will be coming back next fall and really studying this anyway um, so for the short term if there is a um, preference to one of these options from us or do we look to our experts our building administrators to make a recommendation to us or Dr. Carlson to make a recommendation I think he's heard our our philosophical beliefs and uh, feelings but I, I think option a I, I like option a bring it to 28 but I'd like to make it 27 got just for an insurance number <laughs> but uh, <laughs> That seems to be, you know, we add one more session, section, and then, and then let the, and it addresses all of them. It goes in the right direction from what we're all thinking, I think, and then, um, and then let the committee take it up uh, next year and see if it makes some changes. I'll make sure that the, the good point you made about the, the teachers aren't don't have 30 students uh, and they're out there on an island. Uh, they get this. Hopefully, they get the support they need when they need it, uh, mm -hmm. so that so they can be successful. Of course, you heard me say it before, the, the, the perfect ratio is one student to one teacher. <laughs> yeah. um, and there has to be, there has to be some, some time when we have to decide what that line is and, and uh, uh, it, 
part of our job to give these students the best education we can with the with the finances we have available right now we spend 85 percent of our budget on, on uh, salaries and benefits um, so it'd be a little hard to find another five percent somewhere to to staff up too hard but I think I think a would address the needs of the, the class we're talking about and uh, if we took it to 27 I don't think it would make a difference but it would make sure that class gets addressed um, and then I'd like to see that the f philosophical considerations being and it sounds like they are and, and I agree with you we heard that uh, from all the administrators that's my opinion others um, I like those comments Gary so I'm not going to repeat them and that also gives time because um, for SALC if this comes forward in September and I would urge administration to make that happen it's going to take some months to put this together to help us understand economically what we're talking about because I think we're talking about something big and uh, you know or a little big to big big and we need to see that range and that's going <laughs> to that's going <Sorry, laughs> that's going to take a while over the summer for your administrative team <coughs> all of them involved to present that information to the committee and and have that ready for whoever wants to attend that committee meeting as well um, yeah to relook at this formula is a it's a big thing because that that ties strictly to our budget <coughs> and I understand that I understand what the impact means well Kate if I could just respond to that I think that we would be refer and have referred this so that this mm -hmm. will come to the student achievement and learning committee to look at you may actually and would have time because these kind of discussions start in the spring of the year for the next year we will have made a you know decision on one of these options this summer but really taking that time to pull research to say I mean you know this 22 18 24 you know your committee probably could spend the full six eight Absolutely. months studying looking at research and saying what is the appropriate right. level and, and what do way, other districts do as you've indicated how do they deal with that and we are also way ahead in our district um, with our lineup of um, policies that we have waiting for us mm -hmm. to look at we're we're, we really kind of have a lull in a way in the coming year because we've done well, so you well. Aren't we're gonna after this. So we could we could <laughs> give a lot of yeah. time. Oh yeah, and I think this. you may actually have a group of the building administrators working as a side, um, especially the elementary and but all of them I think working as a side committee to bring some recommendations yeah, and so do some work so. for you too. So. Mr. Just, Menninger? Uh, just a couple of comments here. I guess first off I want to thank all those people who have been extremely diligent and and uh, coming to these meetings your voices certainly have been heard and thank you uh, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Carlson and the entire administrative team I know you put a lot of thought into this you've been tasked with a tough job you're you know you've, you're following the the policy that the board has set and then now the board is saying well, maybe we don't like that policy and I agree with that I, I don't think we do like that policy or at least I don't um, from that standpoint I, I do think that is now I'm getting ahead of myself as we look at that policy um, you know we may want to have some verbiage in there to allow ultimately you know the district administrator to potentially have some discretion and override um, as we move forward as well with that um, but I, I like option a for all those same reasons but also because it addresses a broader scale of pre-k to three and to me you know I'm as concerned about all those other <coughs> grades as well um, and certainly not just this one section but all of those that are in that same section and I think for now until we can get a full review this addresses I think you know we don't want to go too far the other way without yeah. a full review right. but right now today this addresses I think the broadest spectrum in that pre-k to three group um, and because of that I, I really like that option a mm -hmm. um, because of the broader scope Hey, anybody else? I, I like um, option A as well. I think uh, I agree with Gary and Tim. Tim, right? Tim Medigar. Tim, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, um, 
one thing about the school district of Holman, when I moved here in 98, I was really impressed with the parent, parent, parent involvement and all that, and this just keeps coming through, and it's really nice to see. Um, in my meetings and talkings with different leadership team people here in the school system, there is many areas. They're doing very proactive things watching the bottom dollar. And in the same breath, there's many areas I think we are lacking greatly in, and there's much room for improvement in this school system that to make it more student-centric. I'm not going to go into detail now because it's, it's not the time, but this, is, this issue that we're all discussing now for an hour is why, why we're here on the board. It's student-centric. <coughs> That's where we got to stay. And um, I think the <coughs> review comment, review, is very big that we have to keep looking at a lot of different areas because we want to make the school system as efficient as possible and student-centric. And I think we're doing it. I really think we are. I think we all agree that um, the students come first. So thank you. Anyone, Anita? I was kind of wavering between option A and option B, and then when Gary said, um, you know, I'd like to go from 20, 27 <laughs> students, my ears pricked up, so I'm on the same bandwagon. We agreed on the now. same night. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Freaks me out too, Gary. But, <laughs> Could I uh, maybe just ask before we go with that, was 28, um, if we um, go to 27, is that going to have And this is what's impact? difficult about this because no matter what number, I mean, that'll be the new threshold. Right. So 28 will be, you know, again, the new number or 27. So right now, again, it's just, it's something that that number does, first of all, address when you do the calculation. And uh, it, does, it does address the uh, needs and the interests at this time. Um, so I, I want to ask clarification as I go leave here to prepare something for the 23rd. Mr. Dunlap had mentioned 27. And again, I don't have the information in front of me of what that would mean right now, but I would need to include that for you. So whether 27 made a difference versus 28. It means you're closer to another section at uh, Viking. Yeah, yeah, right. That would be an example. And I just don't have that with me tonight. So, but I, I could, if that's what I'm hearing, um, 27, I could run that, and that's what I would prepare an issue So we paper. would actually be looking at Viking, Sand Lake, Sand Lake. Or were you just saying well, seven at pre? Well, K, K, K3. K3 we're so as Ms. Jagosinski said, you know, again, according to the numbers from May 29th, um, technically, Viking grade three, I don't think, I mean, I showed 27 even, so. You're close. But it'd be, you're yeah. not there, but you're But that would be the new number. So we would follow, we would follow that. And I can, um, as I craft a new uh, issue paper for two weeks, um, I'll visit with the elementary principals and so on if, if we use the, I mean, at some point we just, we have to use a number, that, that enrollment projection. So whether it's May 29th, June 2nd, June 15th, June 22nd, the day before the 20th, but at some point. And then we continue to monitor and look at that. But if you decide to make a change, then we will stick to that as the summer goes on. I just wanted to clarify, because on the, your presentation, you've got the class size limitation allowed for grades pre-K to 3 from 30 to 28. Pre yeah. And then the next line is pre-kindergarten through grade five class size would not exceed 28. So are we saying? I'm sorry. Yeah. 27 that, that's, for that's both an, of those? Yeah, I think so. Through fifth grade. Okay. 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 Just I was so that it's say, clear. That's, that is an error on my part. I was separating pre-K through three from four and five. So how that looks, that is an error on my part. The intention... I just want you to know the presentation tonight was 28 for pre-K through grade three. That's what I was presenting. 
And so that is an error. Let me just, and what I think I did is I grabbed it from the administrative rule and I did not distinguish a difference between that and grades four and five. Uh, that would be, yeah, the second bullet on that slide would be an error. That would not be consistent okay. with what I presented. <clears throat> so just so if everybody sees that, um, Mrs. Hancock's referencing the second bullet. Pre-kindergarten through grade five class size would not exceed 28. What that should say is pre-kindergarten through grade three. Thank you for catching that okay but but so now to your point what would be the wish that I the draft that I work on I'm hearing I'm hearing 27 yes. pre-k 3 or pre-k 5 start with three and then as we head into the fall and SALC I mean that seems like a, a friendly a compromise, compromise at this point mm -hmm. and good. then let's look at that for future economic impact and also philosophical impact what our beliefs are so are you saying leave four and five at 30 then yeah. or at 28 as he recommended 28. No, oh, this was an error okay it's an error, what you're recommending. Okay, so. That would be a lot bigger move than education mm -hmm. It should be looked at, but at this oh, yeah. time, yeah. I would just say pre-K through three. And at pre -K this point, you know, when I think of, of numbers, no, I'm not comfortable with 30 and fifth grade compared to our neighboring districts. But tonight is like a first yep. step. Yep. So um, I'm comfortable in supporting that and then um, investigating what the consequences are. I'd like to see us do something there. Pre-K pre through grade three, 27. That's what I will put a draft together that you can expect to see on June 23rd. And if the board's comfortable, I can present it, a short, do a short presentation if needed. Um, and if not, um, or I can take any questions. But at this point, and I'll finalize with Mrs. Hancock when the time comes, but we'll also plan to put that on the consent agenda as well. Okay. okay. Thank you, Dr. Carr. Thank you, everybody. Then moving on to 8.2 fuel bids. Beth Hobbs. Hi everyone. Hi. Good evening, Beth. <laughs> Happy first day of no school. <laughs> <laughs> I have a fuel bid that came from a Quick Trip, and that I put out two bids: one to the BP gas station in town, and one to Quick Trip. I only received one back, and that was for Quick Trip. So I would ask that that one be passed. I did a little, um, it says that we're getting four cents above their cost. And when I looked at what that meant was if uh, the gas prices are 358 for unleaded, we're paying about 345. So we're about 13 cents under for that. Diesel fuel, when it's at 389, we're paying about 371. So we're about 18 cents a lower than the, so that's the price we get. And I'm afraid that's what we have to take because <laughs> there's no more fuel. So. <laughs> As a, as a comparative point, back in 2009, June 22nd, 2009, the board approved this bid. It's on a five-year cycle. It was at four cents above their price, so it's exactly the same as it was. Not changed. Yes. And we will approve that, or that comes be the next board meeting. So Correct. if you have any questions, please let us know. They can all walk, right? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Opening a big can of worms there. 
The and next then moving okay. on to parent transportation contract. Yes, we have a contract that we do with our parochial kids. We have St. Pat's and St. Paul's that do half day uh, 4K just like we do. Instead mm -hmm. of sending a bus into town to bring them and take them home. We do parent contracts with those parents that uh, would like to receive that. We had five parents return their slips, so I added one more to that, so it comes to about uh, $1,600 that, it will, that we'll pay, need to pay to parent contracts for those parents that drive their kids, so it's a big. And we do have a statutory responsibility to provide this transportation because the parochial school is located within five miles of our school district boundary uh, but the statutes allow for alternative methods besides driving a school bus or van down and this is one of those methods and it's more cost effective uh, approach uh, much 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 <laughs> okay any questions seeing none then moving on to disposal of property a van yes I don't know if you've seen some of our school vans. We have about 14 of them out there, all different varieties. This one is one of our oldest ones. It is a 2002. It has 217,000 miles on it. The mechanic has deemed it unsafe to drive. The body is falling off the frame. So it is, I went on the blue book and I found that it is estimated at, its fair value price is 628 and according to the school board I need to tell you anything over 300 and we would get we called the salvage yard and we'll get $280 for that if somebody's interested in paying the 628 <laughs> <please contact. laughs> it's in the parking lot if anybody wants it before we get rid of it and then do we have to approve that at the next meeting or is that just for information I think that's for action yeah oh it is for meeting. action right. this evening no, next, 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 meeting. next time. Okay. Correct. He's all three are. Well, and then you mentioned that the 300 was the threshold? Yeah, I have a fair value. It has to be over $300 to $10,000. So we may not get $300 for this, but if we the do, then value. somebody would say, well, you should have gone to the board, so we come to you. And it's, um, I think it's 300 to $1,000 is the middle range. Our disposal policy has below $300, we just get rid of. 300 to 1,000 we come to, there's, depending upon the value of the property, more board involvement. I'm just wondering if that low 300 seems pretty low, if we could consider raising that in the future. Or drive it another year. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna say that. I had a van exactly like that. <laughs> just sell that, just get whatever you can. <laughs> it still Everyone runs run good, and, but it's not safe, so. Thank you very much, Thank ben. you, thank you, have a good evening. Okay, then we have some employee handbook language revisions. Melissa Fates. All right, Clark, I am starting, and I think Jay is picking up the rest. Um, so items A through H, or I, I'm sorry, um, I have placed in your packet. None of these have any intended language changes. I'm not going to review any of them with you this evening because they're simply strike throughs and removing references to section numbers that we don't even use in the handbook, so. Um. And item J is the um, impact on the employee handbook of the health insurance changes the board approved. As you know, in the past, we've not had a dual choice health insurance program, so we needed to recognize the opportunity for dual choicing, and the board changed the district's contribution, and that was specifically stated in the employee handbook, uh, so that update needed to be made as well. You'll notice it's laid out a little bit differently because there's very similar impacts to multiple parts of the handbook, part one dealing with all employees, part two, three, and four dealing with specific groups of employees, so it gets to be a pretty long list of things, but as you look at it, it's it's just those specific changes, the district contribution and dual choicing, which we're calling out. Hey, any questions, discussion? I know we are probably in personnel and governance on the governance end of things. Next year, we'll probably discuss those, the need to bring all of those housekeeping kind of things to us. And, you know, it, I know that many of you review those and, and that type of thing, so it can be a positive thing, but also the, the time for staff to do that. It may just be something that we um, may have a different option or process in place. So, but for now, this is the process we've had. 
Um, so those will come up next meeting. Yes, for approval. Correct, for approval. Correct. Okay, thank you. thank you very much. So then we are to the consent agenda, um, and we have six items this evening. If you would like to pull any of those out for individual consideration, you certainly can do so. Otherwise, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items as presented. I would so move. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. So board member reports and discussion. Just call on board members in the order of roll call. Present any comments or committee reports that you may have. Mr. Cruz. Just personal comments? Sure. Is that, is that okay, Related Joe? to school board, school board stuff. Okay. Yep. I don't have anything. Though. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, I've got to find my place. Mrs. Jagosinski. Um, just thank all the staff and students for a a great school year and have a wonderful and safe summer. Um, Mrs. Mayor? Um, echoing Anita, same thing. Um, I did attend, um, as your rep, the CESA meeting in the past week, and I'm working on um, a brief summary of, of what was discussed. The major feature was on um, rural schools, and in listening to them, um, my ears pierced picked up too. I mean, just from, from things like the cost of gas and how that influences us, those of us who have buses and technology and so many major issues that they're fighting for and training teachers and trying to help schools with. So um, I will get that together by the next board meeting and either email it to you or have something put into folders that kind of summarize Cool. what we talked about but um very very interesting it always is i love doing that so thanks for letting me be your rep on that board well thank you and thanks for reporting back mrs mayor mr menninger um you know it's coming how many weeks of football there are only three more regular school board meetings until fall sports oh, starts man. up i just would that uh, include spring training for the packers and, uh, <laughs> I, I, mean, the I think we only have stuff? two more regular board meetings before that excellent okay that's all i have that's seen. all thank you <laughs> uh, mr dunlap <clears throat> well we, we talked a lot about the budget tonight uh, indirectly and a reminder one that uh, we have some budget challenges coming up ahead of us. Uh, expenses will exceed the income once again. Uh, we've, we've passed that point of where that was not the case a few years ago. So we have to uh, do our due diligence. And I, and I honestly think in, in reflection on Anita's comments that the decisions will be made at the local level. I think the state, the state is bound and determined to balance the state budget. And anything that uh, we generate as a, as a school district will have to be generated at the local level. So keep that in mind. Thank you. And I just have a couple things. First, I have a copy, if you want to take one, um, a copy of the committee assignments for the upcoming year. Take one, Dr. Carlson. Um, and if there are any concerns, I know Alex, I wanted to ask him because he had indicated he would volunteer for two committees. And I need to solidify which that second committee was that he was going to volunteer for. Um, but look at your committees for the upcoming year and um, let me know if you have any concerns and it will go into effect on July 1st, of course. <clears throat> and thank you. I know this past year as we come to a close, um, there was a lot of good work that was done by our board committees and I want to thank you. I know in the past that hasn't always been the case. There's been some years where committees failed to meet or met and really um, did not have any goals identified and so really didn't have a lot accomplished. And so I just want to say thank you for all the hard work. I know as we review those um, policies at the committees, it's um, always a, a big undertaking. Um, I see Joanne Stevens is here and want to congratulate you again. I think, is this your last board meeting? It's your last board meeting and we will miss you and um, have always enjoyed seeing you in the audience and um, we do appreciate, and I think we said at the, the retirements, um, the impact that you've had. You've enriched the lives of many students and also of the staff that you've been able to mentor and guide. And so thank you for all you've done because that will in fact affect the lives of students to come. So thank you and, and be well.
well and enjoy your retirement. So and that's, your 11 grandkids. Yes, yes, family. So that's all I really have. I would just note that correspondence folder um, went through. Um, board meeting scheduled June 18th. We've got a workshop with Matthew Fail at 6 o'clock here in the boardroom. The 23rd is a regular board meeting. The July 14th and July 28th are our July board meeting dates. And board meeting reflection, any concerns? I think with all of the, the big discussion and decisions and things, it really went quite well and I appreciate, um, I think a couple board members caught themselves when um, they wanted to maybe speak second and third time, but I appreciate that, that people were um, even becoming more aware of it so I don't have to hit the gavel or anything. So, <laughs> Tom. I'm going to say something that's not related to the board at all. My son started OCS training yesterday in Rhode Island for um, Navy officer training, so I'm just really proud of him. So. Oh, see, now that would be a perfect thing under board members. Comments. Okay. So, so as he's a new, as Tom's a new board member, yeah, yeah that's great. Though I'm glad you shared that with us. Thank you. That's great. And I had a new grandson Wednesday. Yes. Oh boy. Oh, yes. <laughs> that makes 28, I think. <laughs> it is nice. <laughs> 28. <laughs> it just seems like 28. It just seems like it. So anything on the board reflections or reflections on the board norms? Seeing none, then I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of adjourning, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Oh, yeah. Good, good. I hope that is okay. Yep. <laughs>